So what exactly do reception scholars do? Well, we look at the representation or the use of antiquity in instances of modern culture. Um, we are sort of engaged with the provenance of reception studies throughout time. And that's what this first half is going to be all about. Uh, let me try and move this PowerPoint forward. Does it seem to be responding? There we go. Now, you might be wondering now why I've got a picture of Stephen Fry's mythos uh, on, the, on the screen. Well, it's because of a, a little thing at the bottom there. It says the Greek myths retold, and retold is the key word here. Um, and it's a very interesting use of, of phrasing here by Stephen Fry. He is not directly retelling the myths of ancient Greece or ancient Rome uh, as uh, the source materials dictate. He's not literally going back and uh, going to the, uh, the ancient Greek versions and reciting verbatim the ancient Greek on which you know, it was inscribed. No, he is retelling the myths um, in his own image, um, in his own language even. Uh, and he is doing so with the view of a receptions historian. Um, he is considering everything that has come before, the ways in which the Greek myths have been told uh, in the past, uh, and all the different ways through all different, kind of different languages, and he is interpreting it in his own specific way to tell to a specific audience. And this is the kind of thing that reception scholars are engaged with. We look at works such as Stephen Fry's mythos, and we ask ourselves the question, why is he doing these specific things? And in what ways is he doing them? What is he hoping to accomplish by uh, retelling these myths in a specific way? Is it as straightforward as, here's a Greek myth, I'll tell it my own way, or might there be a little bit more to it? And by the tone of my voice, you can probably tell that it's, it's the latter rather than the former. Uh, so the first half will consist of um, the, an explanation of the proliferation of the classics in modern culture. We'll go into that a little bit, uh, followed by uh, an explanation of the key scholars uh, that you might encounter, you know, some of the big names. So if you want to go off and do your own research, you'll be able to have some leads of your own. Uh, and then finally, we're going to use what we've learned to look at reception uh, of classics as a chain. Uh, and you'll find out a little bit more about that later. But uh, right now, I want to immediately put you into breakout rooms. So Georgie, if you would be so kind as to prepare a, a breakout room, uh, what I want you to do is to consider and think of examples where ancient material has been used in modern culture for a specific purpose. Now that may be in film, television, video games, literature, music, art, anything, anything you want. I want you to think of some examples where it's been used in modern culture for a specific purpose. Maybe you don't know the specific purpose, but you do know of an example that's absolutely fine too. So we're gonna give you uh, about two minutes in breakout groups to discuss. I'm getting you to do my dirty work here, but don't worry, we'll have a chat about it afterwards. Uh, and uh, I'll see you again in about two minutes. Okay. Okay, we're back. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully you uh, managed to throw around a couple of ideas uh, within your groups. Um, if, uh, if a couple of you want to offer some suggestions, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and, uh, and go ahead. Uh, either, you know, if you want to put the, the whole hand up thing, I think you could do on Zoom, or if you just want to unmute, unmute yourselves and shout out, that's absolutely fine. Please go ahead. I could go, if you like. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, we were talking about um, the film 300. Uh, and, oh, by the way, hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were talking about the film 300, and I mentioned that I was at the moment, I'm playing the um, the video game God of War. Ah, oh, of course, nice. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so that's you know one example of um, mythic representation in video games. And uh, uh, and did you uh, have a little bit of a conversation about you know the kind of aims or objectives you know the what they're trying to achieve by portraying these mythological concepts in a video game format at all? Maybe you could has uh, you know kind of guess that. Um, yeah, well, we didn't talk about it because we were mainly just excited to be able to speak to people, <laughs> just introducing ourselves. Um, but I suppose um, what well, I was talking about how uh, I found I'm finding the game interesting just playing it um, because 
the main character is uh, a Greek god from the Greek pantheon, but he lives in uh, a kind of Viking society where they believe in that the, the ancient Norse gods. So it's combining them, I think, in interesting ways. But I haven't got to the end yet as well. So I think there's more spoilers like uh, waiting ahead for me. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Cassie. Yeah, that, it's really interesting how um, different visual mediums and interactive visual mediums like video games uh, explore the intersection between not just these different mythologies, but uh, the different modes of, um, I guess, coming face to face with the classics in some way. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for that example. Anybody else? Yes, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go ahead. I was telling Lucy and Lydia uh, in a very rude way because I basically cut them off by just leaving <laughs> because we were back in the in the in the big room but basically yeah, I was mentioning Virginia Woolf and her own uses of um, Hellenistic cultures and references and with her I think in uh, specific instances especially in Orlando the idea is really to um, reference implicitly to make implicit reference to the island of Lesbos and to uh, let's say um, Hellenistic cultures and it's um, sexually androgynous and sexually experimental uh, aspects. So that's that's more tied to like yeah her androgynous explorations in general. That's really interesting. So it, it's it's kind of uh, insert correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of in some ways exploring the sapphic side of yeah. of literature in in a very yeah. real way. Um, and uh, you know in my own work as well. So my PhD is in the racial and political implications of um, uh, the Gothic and its uh, relationship with the classics. Uh, and you find in a lot of ways that they will uh, utilize classical motifs or, or classical um, uh, iconography, such like, in a similar way to, to portray that kind of message. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting point as well. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a few of my own examples, some uh, hand-picked examples uh, I've come up with over here. Let me just see if this PowerPoint moves again. Here we go. I'm sure you can uh, all recognize this figure. Yes, it is uh, Hades and Charon on the sticks in, in Hercules. And it's, it's really quite interesting how they um, you know, portray this. I think it's James Woods who voices Hades here. And he's kind of like a slick talking um, a car, used car salesman. <laughs> I, I want to describe him that way. Um, and and it's, it's quite unique. Uh, I don't think you'll get another portrayal quite like this. Uh, but if you look back at the... Uh, the, the ancient examples, you don't really get that much of Hades um, as an individual um, for many different reasons. Uh, some thought it was bad luck to invoke Hades' name, seeing as Hades is the god of the underworld. Um, whereas others, um, there were conflicting uh, representations of Hades uh, back in the day where, you know, some of it would be, um, it would consist of um, an impartial figure in the mythos and in the pantheon because if death was on somebody's side especially during the trojan war you'll see that in the iliad he doesn't really take a side and you know if death were to take a side between the trojans or the um it, it, it would be kind of it would be kind of uh, a mess in all honesty it would be a one-sided battle um and then on the other hand, you've got, uh, of course, the, the capture of Persephone, um, where he is uh, almost vilified nowadays um, uh, in, in different forms of media and in different literature as well, uh, where he kidnaps Persephone and takes her for his own uh, as his bride in the underworld, where she is uh, ungodly happy, if you pardon the pun. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's almost portrayed as a kind of, a, you know, a kidnap, as an assault, uh, and in many ways it is. Um, what the older sources say is that um, Hades actually struck a bargain with Zeus um, in saying that, okay, uh, I would like a bride for myself. And, Hades, and Zeus says, right, yeah, okay, you can have Persephone. Uh, Demeter seems fine with it, um, so go ahead. And when the time comes, Hades doesn't see that he's doing anything wrong by kidnapping Persephone because he has Zeus's blessing. Um, and in all honesty, in the uh, ancient sources as well, uh, if you look at the actions of Zeus and Poseidon, who are uh, referenced a lot more, and they are the center of a lot more of the uh, mythological narratives, 
they do a lot worse things than Hades does. So it's very interesting to see how Hades over time becomes vilified in such an exaggerated way like this. Uh, and it's interesting to contemplate, I'll leave this in, the, in your own time to contemplate, why this is, why he's gone from being sort of a more impartial figure than anything to literally, you know, the, the kind of guy who tries to screw you over uh, at any chance he gets, who, who rules over a world where everybody is eternally unhappy. Um, Another example, one of my favorite uh, films uh, is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, and specifically the portrayal of Big Dan. Now, uh, Big Dan is supposed to be a foil or a representation of the, um, of the Cyclops that appears in Homer's Odyssey. And indeed, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? is a reimagining, we get that word again, or retelling of Homer's Odyssey. So if you're interested in that film, I strongly suggest check that out because there's a lot of interesting underlying um, messages in this film regarding race, uh, regarding um, the gender roles as well. So if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, and specifically with Big Dan, the camera angles, uh, whenever he's on screen, the, if, you, if you see in that one picture in the middle, it's always tilted upwards to make him seem a lot bigger on screen than he actually is, is to exaggerate his presence. Um, and when you go back to descriptions of the Cyclops as well, indeed, he is towering above uh, Odysseus and his crew. Um, so it's a matter of engaging with the ancient source materials in different ways and different imaginative ways. It's not just to do with writing. It's not just to do with the art. But sometimes it can even be to do with the camera angles uh, through, you know, through this expression. And finally, it's been mentioned uh, already, but uh, 300. Uh, and more specifically, the representation of Xerxes, uh, the Persian king. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with um, Lloyd Llewellyn's um, work, uh, he discusses uh, at great length uh, the vilification, uh, I want to say, the vilification of um, the Middle East and um, pop culture, uh, sorry, punk culture following 9-11 specifically. Uh, He's done some great work uh, in, in this area, and I really strongly suggest that you check him out. And he's actually one of the key speakers that come later, the, the key uh, reception scholars that I'll be discussing. Uh, but it's not just in film. I mean, the, the left-hand picture of Xerxes there, that is how they were portrayed uh, in the comic books uh, that came before the film. Um, so it's really interesting how we're following this, this chain of reception whereby we've got the ancient sources, then we've got portrayals such as the comic book, where Xerxes is decked in gold. Uh, and then the film adaptation is based off the comic, so that adds another link to this chain of reception. So hopefully you start to see where we're going here in terms of this imagery of reception as a chain, because we have to, you know, as reception scholars, we kind of have to trace that chain back uh, if we want to understand fully how they are um, changing the source material and for what specific purpose, okay? It's not a matter of how accurate they are or they aren't. And Hebe will speak about a little bit about this later. The accuracy, if you're talking about the accuracy, that kind of misses the point of reception studies. It's about asking why, for what purpose, and does it change the way in which we evaluate the role of the classics in modern society? And does it change the way in which we look at the original source material? And there's a very famous um, uh, interview with the director of Troy, uh, Wolfgang Peterson, on audience critique. And I'll give you a bit of a quotation here. Uh, they want to see how Brad Pitt as Achilles takes his destiny in his own hand. They want Orlando Bloom as Paris to fight and then run away because he's a coward and not because the gods command. Now this suggests that audience demand and expectations have a direct impact on the creative process when deciding how to portray or, again, reimagine these mythological figures. So once again, it's about why and for what purpose, not about how accurate it is. That's the point, that's the real core of reception studies. And here we have some of the uh, the big names, the pioneers in reception studies, uh, just in case you want to go ahead and uh, take a look for yourself. First of all, we have Martindale, uh, Charles Martindale. Um, and he says, reception has helped to challenge the traditional idea of what classics is. 
it's no longer a dusty thing kept on shelves that is unchanged throughout the course of time. It's something that is actually evolving uh, as it is um, utilized in modern culture for many different ways and for different purposes. Uh, Gideon Nisbet says that um, the interaction between modern society's collective beliefs and the mass media it produces are intrinsic to how we actually evaluate and look at classics today. And Lloyd Llewellyn Jones, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and this is to do with um, you know, the big, names, the big name films such as Cleopatra, he goes into how Hollywood carefully and skillfully created the popular modern perception of the ancient world. Hollywood has had an extraordinary impact on how we perceive the past. Whether we know it or not, or whether we are actively aware of it or not, every single scene in Cleopatra is shot and designed in a specific way to produce or convey a specific message that the director and the producers and the scriptwriters they want us to latch onto. And really, it's, it's summed up pretty well with, with uh, Martin Winkler. Um, where he says the reception of classical art and literature has now become inseparable from the ancient works themselves. We can't help but think of the ancient works when we look at something like Cleopatra, they're intrinsically linked now. With every new piece of media that is generated, it creates a link back to the past. And the cinema exemplifies the continuing importance of classical works in a way that it's relevant to our modern society. Either it is portraying the morals that we want to exemplify or else, um, or, or else shun if we look down upon them in modern day society, uh, or else to portray, like um, uh, Peterson said earlier, Wolfgang Peterson, exactly what the audience wants to see. They want to see themselves in the characters. They want to see themselves in those positions. Now, I want you to go back into your breakout rooms. Uh, so, Georgie, if you wouldn't mind preparing that. And I want you to think about the difficulties a reception scholar like myself or Hebe might face when attempting to examine or trace this chain of reception uh, across these different mediums. Not, not necessarily just with, with film, but perhaps with literature. Language might play a key role. Or even in music, these different representations and how they are conveyed. Okay, see you in two minutes. Okay, I believe everybody's back. Um, so yeah, uh, as you can see from my uh, little, uh, little image on the screen there, we've got reception as a chain, and I'm really curious to, to hear about your, your, uh, your viewpoints on this. Uh, what do you think the difficulties might be? So uh, feel free to either raise your hand or if you want to just unmute your mic and go ahead and speak, whatever. Hey again. <laughs> yeah, I was just, uh, we were talking with um, Lydia on the, on the fact that maybe sources might be lacking uh, for some um, text or, or elements of culture in particular, or even translation problems. I mean, there is a good chance that if you're studying classics that you might, I don't know, be into Latin and Greek or whatever, but, you know, sometimes it may be another dialect. Lydia was mentioning um, Sappho. I had no idea of that, but apparently it came in a completely different Greek dialect. So here is an example, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think you've hit on two key points there, namely the classical sources and the translation aspect of it. I just want to focus on the translation for a second there. Yeah, you're right. There are different dialects in all kinds of different languages, not just in the original dialect in which it was written. But over time, People have uh, adapted that language to their own language, and you know there are elements that are lost in translation, especially if it's uh, of a subdialect of a language. Uh, and then over time, that has been taken as the new baseline, if you if you want to if you want to put it that way. Uh, for example, even just with um, Stephen Fry's Mythos, so he's got his own version, but he's drawn off several other people who have done the same as him, who have compiled different myths and retold them in their own way. They've got them probably off other people from different languages, different backgrounds, who have put different nuances and different emphases on sections that may not be in the original, and so on and so forth over time, until in some instances, it's almost unrecognizable as the original. 
Uh, but it's all about trying to tease out why that's the case. Uh, of course, we can very easily say, oh, that's not like this, or this isn't accurate uh, in terms of X, Y, or Z. But it's another thing entirely to be able to tease out the whys and the hows. And I think that's a very good point you made. Thank you. Anybody else? I can go again if you like. Please do. Right. Um, in our room, we were talking about um, some of the difficulties of uh, looking at reception in terms of context. Um, so both uh, in terms of the time context. So obviously the way that things might be received now would be it's difficult to know it throughout different time periods without being an expert in all of them. Um, and also just the idea of um, what an audience is as well. Um, so an audience obviously isn't just uh, an easily categorized uh, concept. It could be that even within one national context, you could have lots of different um, interpretations uh, of, of what's going on. I think towards the end, we were saying, uh, we were saying about um, uh, Metalheads loving Thor, for example, is like a small niche group that uh, is uh, maybe quite different to um, a broader audience. You're, you're absolutely right that you've hit the nail on the head with the audience bits there. And, and with regards to the context, I think that's a very important thing to consider because you take a film like Cleopatra, 1917 Cleopatra, where the pretty much the entire cast, uh, I believe, was white, but they are portraying, you know, individuals that in their original context would certainly not have been, almost certainly not have been white, you know? Um, and uh, we can also take this uh, in, you know, the film that I shared earlier, Way Brother, Where Art Thou, that, because uh, Big Dan as the Cyclops, he is actually, uh, it transpires, this isn't a huge spoiler or anything, but it transpires that he is a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and that has broad implications on the story as a whole, but also on the message that they're trying to convey for that specific time period in which the film was set, but also looking back on that time period uh, from when the film itself was made. So you've got many different layers here to consider when we're thinking of the reception of classics as a chain going back. Thank you very much. Um, and some of the other difficulties that we might come across, uh, for example, or the different influences, a big one is the influence of religion or specifically Christianity. Now the Christian influence on many different texts has been a prolific one. Um, going back to the Hades example, a big reason in, what, in, in which, you know, Hades is vilified in a lot of visual media and a lot of comic books and video games today as the big scary god of death is because um, in, a, in you know, a lot of Christian texts, um, death is something to be feared if you are not a follower of the religion. And so the image of Hades and perhaps the devil or demonic entities have been conflated over time in different ways. You look at Dante's Inferno as well. Uh, you see this kind of process. This, that's sort of the middle ground uh, between representations of the afterlife uh, before and representations of the afterlife after as this chain of reception. That's a very interesting path to take as well. Um, and with regards to the audience thing, yeah, we, we, we tend to look at a lot of things nowadays with a very Anglo-American or Eurocentric viewpoint. And it's about learning or training ourselves to look at things from different perspectives um, and to consider what the original source material intended, but also what those who received it afterwards intended to do with it. So for example, I've got some uh, little things here to show you. We start off with Hades, and we end up with something like this. Hades uh, on this, uh, uh, I believe it's a Kylix, or is it an amphora? I think it's a Kylix, um, is uh, talking to uh, a group of humans, uh, mortals, uh, giving them perhaps wise counsel or advice. Um, and you know, Hades is, is very rarely seen in such an explicit way uh, in, in, in this way as, as far as the surviving evidence goes. But then you look <laughs> and somewhere along the way, he's become this figure on the right, this fast talking used car salesman like personality who wants to screw you over at every opportunity. What's that about? Well, this is another example. We've got, uh, uh, I believe it's Achilles here dragging the body of uh, poor Hector uh, around the grave of Patroclus. From there, we get the modern representation along the way of Troy. And it's really interesting to see how this has changed throughout time, all the, you know, the iconographic representations have changed throughout time. And indeed, 
in the same way how Stephen Fry himself might retell the Iliad or indeed the Odyssey that comes after it. What kind of words is he using to describe these scenarios? Why does he choose these specific words in this specific context? Maybe if you pick up a copy of Mythos, next time you read it through, if you've read it through already, maybe you want to think about some of the words he uses and the choice vocabulary. Why does he use these words specifically to describe the events going on? Perhaps is he paralleling uh, modern day political events? Or is he trying to craft a social commentary of some kind? These are things to think about the next time you pick up a copy of Mythos. And just for the classicist among you, uh, these are the references for the, the two uh, classical sources I used just there. Uh, this recording will be going online at some point, so you will be able to replay this slide and, and take, a, take a look at them, or else feel free to screenshot at this point. And that pretty much comes to the end of my part. So hopefully by the end of this part, you have a good grasp of what it means to be a reception scholar, what kind of things we're trying to think about, and how we're approaching these different sources. And I'm gonna hand over now to Hebe. Uh, feel free to contact me on my Twitter or email if you have any questions after this session. I'll hand you over now, thank you. So following on from that, before we do start though, I will actually say, I do disagree with Reese on one thing, which is about Hades. <laughs> um, we haven't ever had this conversation, I suspect we'll have it after which is that if you are aware of um, Tumblr, which is a social media site where people can put their artwork and uh, write their own stories, the Hades and Penelope AU alternative universe is a really big theme um, for a lot of the kind of like the fandom um, literature and art where people kind of, it's almost like a Romeo and Juliet um, so there's this quite odd thing where Hades has actually become romanticised typically behind like teenage girls, um, which is kind of a different way of looking at the Hades myth. But we are going to be looking at Thor Ragnarok uh, for mine. So I did my master's uh, dissertation was on uh, Roman gladiators and arenas in science fiction films of the 21st century. And Thor was one of the, the main films that I was looking at. So a quick thing of why bother with films? Accuracy, the myth of Rome, then looking at Thor Ragnarok in particular, and I'll be showing a short clip. Then there are some questions for you to all kind of go away and talk about. Um, and then I have got my sources at the end if people want to look it up. So why bother with films? Um, what is the point? Um, you do kind of still get the old guard, shall we call them, of the traditionalists who don't like films, don't like modern films, and certainly don't think that a proper academic should be looking at, say, The Hunger Games or Thor Ragnarok. But the truth is that in the 20th century, the cinema has become one of the most prominent forms of entertainment that the general populace does come in contact with. And so if we look at 2018, in the UK alone, there were 177,000,481 cinema emissions, uh, which is a lot. And this is also the highest attendance for almost 50 years. And so in one year, we spent 1,277,000,222,327 pounds. So there are a lot of people spending a lot of money going to the cinema. So it has this massive impact in the general kind of knowledge and the general understanding of the worlds that it's portraying. Um, there are a few other medias that can rival it in terms of its power and the simple fact is that more people will have seen say 300 or Troy or Gladiator than will have read the Aeneid in the original language or will be able to quote the Odyssey. That is a simple fact. And so we need to address that and look at it. Um, and it has basically become the baseline for popular understandings of ancient Rome in particular. So the question of accuracy. So Reese kind of mentioned this of, you can watch a film, I've got the example of Gladiator here, and do the game of let's point out all the mistakes. And like a classic one is the opening scene where he is uh, riding through the lines of his troops and he's got a dog with him and that dog breed didn't exist in the ancient world. 
you can point that out, that's fine, but it's not particularly interesting and it's kind of missing the whole point of reception studies which is saying why, why is it different, why has this happened? And so there's a nice quote from Makins who says that accuracy is neither the only nor the best criterion by which to judge perceptions. Because the simple fact is that filmmakers are not historians. They're not trying to make a film for historians. If they tried to do that, they would not be making it for very many people. And the fact is that if you only made a film once, every single historian in the world was happy, it would never be made. Um, so to try and hold them to the same standards is simply unrealistic. You can't do it. And again, Winkler um, is a kind of a big name um, in the film kind of conversation for reception studies. And he points out that where a historian might aim objectivity and a conclusion rooted in documents, a narrative filmmaker hopes to deliver an emotionally resonant past and a cathartic climax. So again, using the example of Gladiator, um, the whole thing of Commodus being murdered in the arena and him, you know, Maximus finally getting his moment of revenge. Emotionally, fantastic, and we're all leaving the cinema satisfied. It's sad that he dies in the end as well. But, you know, we basically leave the cinema very satisfied. Um, a historian is going to look about kind of crying and saying that's not how it happened. But to the general populace, they don't know that and they don't really care um, a lot of the time. So what are the films basing their reception studies off? If they're not basing it off fact, if they're not going through the ancient documents and looking at the sources and looking at archaeological records, where are they getting their information from? They're getting it from other reception studies. They are getting it from previous films, uh, from previous TV shows. So they're relying on a well-established motifs, imported elements from parallel traditions, and moments thematically consistent with the tone of the film. So a lot of fight scenes seem very familiar. Um, war scenes can only really be played out in a certain number of ways. So you kind of get that same feeling between Gladiator and a lot of, say, Second World War films for the big battle scene at the beginning. It's that same kind of, um, the motifs are very, very similar. And so these motifs or invented traditions, they are trying to repeat these tropes over and over and over again. And if you repeat it enough times, it becomes a fact to the general populace, which is what we're about to see now. So we've looked at accuracy and we've said accuracy isn't important and it's not what we really need to consider. What we do need to consider instead is very nicely referred to as the myth of Rome. So to clarify, this does not mean the myths that the Romans and the Greeks were telling themselves. It is our myth of how Rome was. And this applies to everything. So for example, as, as somebody who has never studied Henry VIII in an academic sense, my knowledge of Henry VIII does come from like the Tudors TV show and the other Berlin girl. That's where my myth of that kind of period of English history comes from. Um, and, and so we need to kind of accept this, um, that there is this, incorrectness to reception studies, which will always be there. And so where does this actually come from? So Josh L. and Mam Malamud, can't pronounce his name, um, they argue that our understanding of Rome is influenced by different mediums and shifts over time. And then they give this lovely definition um, that it shifts in accordance to the political and social circumstances of particular historical moments, changes in generic and artistic conventions, the very technologies of different media, the ideological frameworks of individual writers, directors and artists, and the aesthetic sensibilities and desires of their spectators and consumers. So what one generation thinks of as historical fact can be vastly different from the next one. And a very kind of short, clear example is if we as a kind of generation that have seen films in the 21st century think of Rome, we think of the battles, we think of kind of barbarians versus like the Romans. That tends to be the theme of Roman films of the 21st century. Vastly different to Rome films of the 20th century, which tend to have a very, very strong Christian theme in it. It's frequently is like the good Christian who manages to convert their kind of Roman lover or something along that lines. 
And so Bondanella argues that the Western tradition actually owes far more to this myth than to reality. And that's, as I said before, because far more people will have seen these myths, Rome, 300, uh, Troy, than actually know the historical fact. And so it's, I don't think that's particularly surprising. Um, Bondanella, again, defines it really nicely, says that the myth of Rome is more supple, adaptable and ambiguous, and also more flamboyant, fascinating and attractive to the imagination. It's basically just more fun and you can do what you want with it. So a very, very clear example, which I was actually shocked when I found out that this was a myth, is the Roman salute. Um, I won't do it because it does, unfortunately, obviously have quite strong visual links to the Nazis. So I won't do that just in case. Um, but the Roman salute is completely fake. It doesn't exist in the Roman world. The closest thing you ever get to is the statue of Augustus where he has his hand pointed outwards, but that's not a salute, that's something entirely different. But this salute is now part of Rome because we see it in the cinema, we see it in artwork, we see it in TV series. We are completely, we're completely seduced by this idea of it because it has been repeated to us so many times. And if you're interested in how this comes about, I've got a picture of Martin Winkler's book, um, and it, it's literally just about the Roman salute and about how this has become part of our image of Rome. And so it doesn't matter that Romans didn't have orgies the entire time. It doesn't matter that they didn't say, we who are about to die salute you before every gladiator fight. We believe it because it's part of the myth. So that's kind of giving you some of the big things to be thinking about in terms of accuracy and then the myth and the different ways that we then look at it. So we're going to watch a very short clip from Thor Ragnarok. If you haven't seen Thor Ragnarok, don't worry, um, because it is basically just what we see in the short clip, which is the running up to a gladiator fight between Thor and Hulk. And so it is just looking at it and thinking of some of the following questions. So what Roman elements, historical or mythical, can you identify? And how are these have been adapted? How are they adapted to suit a science fiction film specifically? Um, if you do know the film, like feel free to add in if there are kind of examples that support your argument. And why adapt them? Why not just have it as a proper, historically accurate gladiator fight? Um, and then it's more of a personal question. There aren't right or wrong answers. Do you think it matters if the film isn't historically accurate? So I'm going to now attempt to get this to come up. I'm hoping it works. Oh, God. Wow. I'm not sure. Can, wait, can anybody see it or is it still just me? No, can't see. I've been shaking heads, right? Oh, it's, yeah, if you go uh, new, new share. share. And then a bit. There we go. Right. Okay. I'm going to pause it there. Unfortunately, we won't actually see the, the fight itself. Um, but then that gives you an idea. So here are the questions. So if we can sort out the breakout groups, um, and then we'll have a couple of minutes to kind of discuss it, and then we can come back and have like a, a full group discussion. Right, I think people are coming back. Um, I have been made aware that I think we might run over slightly. It just kind of depends if people need to leave um, at three. Obviously, that is entirely fine. Um, but just kind of, I suppose, depending on how much um, people have to really say about the questions. So um, feel free to unmute and kind of just jump in. What do people have to say? Um, one element we were discussing was obviously the architecture of the whole thing is very reminiscent of like Colosseums. I'm thinking of the Roman Colosseum because that's yeah. the one I visited. Um, and just like with the hologram, you've almost got the emperor figure who's presiding over it and deciding everyone's fate and the arena environment. Um, so that was like one big Roman element that we really know. Yeah. I think I think that's probably the most obvious one, um, and it, and it is really nice, like you said, like the hologram um, is bringing it out into kind of a, the twenty first century and beyond. What isn't unfortunately made particularly clear in that one particular clip is where Loki goes to sit 
um, is very much shown as being a separate um, section of the audience. And you get this kind of image of the Roman um, emperor's box, which very frequently gets shown into the films um, of both Rome and then arena films. Um, but yeah, the Roman Colosseum definitely is the big one. Anything else? We were talking about the um, two things, the armour um, that, that they were wearing, um, well, he was wearing, um, and a bit about how that was kind of a mixture of sci-fi and maybe more traditional. Yeah. Um, we also mentioned the crown of thorns as well that the, that the women were wearing. So we didn't know if that was uh, something that actually existed in... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's not one I had ever picked up, but now that you said that, that's very true. Um, so yes, the second one, I can't really add anything to that because that hasn't been something I'd ever noticed. I want to go rewatch that now. Um, I think they were wearing like some sort of hair, though, because it is me and me and Cassie were talking together. Like they were wearing something in their hair. Yeah. Um, Roman equivalent, I think, is the olive branches, that kind of mm. like olive branches. And then we were like, where did that come from? Was it like a Christianization of Rome? Like, did they even wear anything in their hair like that? No, that, that's a really good one. As I say, like, this is the thing I love about reception study as well is I come at it from like a Roman perspective a lot of the time, but someone who looks at it from a Greek perspective or an Egyptian perspective might also spot other references that I've never seen, which I think is great. Um, the the armour point is very good. Um, so there's kind of two things to say about that. The first is that um, this film, Thor Ragnarok, is mostly based on a Hulk comic called uh, Planet Hulk. There are a lot of adaptations to it, but the armor for Hulk is basically copied from the comic. So then it would be a case of a bit like 300, where the film is based on a comic, of having to then trace, trace everything backwards and where did the comic get it from? But there is also a, a very common theme in arena type entertainments in films where gladiators are very disorganized in their armor. Um, you see uh, Thor literally going and picking out his armor and there's a very famous scene in Gladiator where he goes along the row of helmets and chooses the very kind of iconic helmet that he wears. So it contrasts very, very sharply to soldiers in these films because the soldiers, in whether they are Roman soldiers or sci-fi soldiers of some sort are very uniformed, very clearly separated. So it's kind of this chaos versus organization duality is really interesting, which if anyone knows anything about gladiators, it's mildly infuriating because the gladiators had very, very strict types. And so you would recognize what a gladiator type was by his armor it would kind of be the equivalent of someone in the year 3000 having a cricketer, a rugby player and a football player together on one team and saying they're all playing the same sport. And all of us would be sat there and like, mm, no, they're very different uniforms. Like you can't put a fencer and a cricketer together just because they both wear white. It's that kind of equivalent. <laughs> Apparently we like my joke. I really like so that. Someone that. Liked that, was it. that was a good one. I like <laughs> But yes, so the armour is a, is a really good one as well. What did you guys say about whether it matters if a film is accurate? What was your kind of opinion, if anyone had an opinion on it? We didn't, we didn't get time to go that far, which was really sad. Uh, oh. We were just, yeah, so it was really sad, but we didn't get a chance to answer that one. I don't know if that's how everybody else kind of... Um, well, what would you say of, now, just if I asked you it straight away, what, what do you personally think about it? No, no, definitely not in genre fiction either. Like, I don't, you know, in, it, like, I, I work with science fiction um, and you're, you're asked to take that leap to just believe everything is real anyway. So I think the more, the more important thing is how it kind of casts Thor and, uh, and Hulk and is as, uh, as opposites rather than teammates. But yeah, that's, that's my kind of my opinion. No, I like that. Yeah, I think it does, I'm kind of now related to it, so I do romance novels, um, 
And I know there are some genres of romance where the historical accuracy is super important because the readers who read those genres, I mean, particularly the Regency, they will like email the publishers and the authors and mean like, mm, they didn't wear that kind of dress in that period of the Regency. That's inaccurate. But then there's others where if you're just reading, you know, like a medieval romance, people are like, yeah, we don't care as long as it's got the rough atmosphere, as long as it gives us the tropes we want. So I think probably with Marvel, they can get away with it because that's not what the audience are going there to see. The audience are going there to just enjoy that epic battle, to enjoy that, you know, the cosmic universe. They're not going there to be like, oh, that, that armor's not really on point for, you know. So I think audience, again, really comes into it and matters and has a big impact. Lucy, I really want to talk to you about that, actually, because I was just, I was thinking... Oh, it's paused. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh dear. Hopefully it'll come back in a second. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it was nice because I remember going to see Thor in the in the theatre um, when it came out. And even me as someone who does know quite a lot about the gladiators, I would never go into a science fiction film and say, well, that's not correct. Even when I watch something like, um, say, the Spartacus TV series, um, which there are definitely pros and cons to it. There are certain things which are so detailed. It would be brilliant if they put it in, um, but at the same time, you can entirely understand that visually things aren't always possible. So things like in the Roman world, everything's about hierarchy and about having the rich and the poor separated and men and women separated. And visually you can do that to an extent. You can make it very clear of rich and poor divide. But then at what point do you start having groups of young boys with their tutors and then, say, the Vestal Virgins? It, it, it gets to a point where I think even in a Roman-based film, it's still a case of reception studies. It's still a case of pleasing a mass audience. So whilst I think that changing things ridiculously I do find annoying let's take the example of Troy which lasts about three days but like you could have just put 10 years later like literally just do 10 years later done and I would have been 90% happier with that film I think there's always that leeway that has to be done of just for the the cinematic experience um, of a film so does anyone have any other comments that they'd like to make about Thor Ragnarok or reception studies in general really No. <laughs> right. I'm aware we're kind of going over time. Um, so I will put, this is just my, my bibliography. Um, if anyone wanted to kind of have a look um, at some of the sources for themselves, Winkler, uh, Winkler, he's um, the kind of big name, especially for Roman reception studies. Um, Cause as I said, I'm, I'm Rome versus Greek reception studies. Um, here we go. Well, hope you all found this uh, to be a useful thing. If you if you, you know, never embarked on uh, classical studies and you know those down reception studies before, then hopefully you found something interesting about the courses. And for those seasoned veterans among you, I uh, hope this is a good refresher for you as well. And maybe got your imagination uh, running up again after the big long break uh, that we've had uh, during lockdown. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening, everybody. We're going to hand you back to uh, uh, Georgie now. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, thank you both, uh, Reese and Hebe, for a really fascinating workshop, um, and thank you everyone for for coming and for taking some time out of your day to join us. Um, I'm just going to ask if everyone here can um, just turn on their mics to give uh, Reese and Hebe a round of applause. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and uh, as, as I said, um, you can, I've posted the contact details to Reese and Hebe in the chat, so you can get in touch with them if you have any further questions. Um, and we're also on Twitter with the hashtag Midspot Classics. We've been sharing some of the points from the discussions. Uh, so do check that out and carry on um, the discussions. I am now wanting to go and watch Thor and many other films. So I'll probably post any thoughts I have later um, with that hashtag. But, um, but yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us, joining in with today's workshop, and we'll see you for the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.